Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. This is our weekend podcast. We bring out the big guns. Bill Crystal joining us today. Bill, how are you? How, how have you managed to navigate the first week of daylight savings time? I, I'm I'm fine, and thank you. I'm so flattered to be called a big gun. I think I should just you know quit while I'm ahead here and uh, sign off. But I know I'm not having. When you get older, you know, um, I don't know. You don't sleep so well anyway, and you wake up early, and so the whole. Daylight, the whole notion that, gee, it's terrible. I can't sleep in anymore. Well, you can't sleep in anyway. So, see, what I can't figure out is, you know, um, my my dogs are on a schedule. I mean, they they have an internal clock in their head. So the the old dog who's sixteen years old, um, yeah. at, at at about four twenty every afternoon, will 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 come into my office and say, uh, hey, it's time for me to eat. Could you could you tell mom, you know, to make me dinner and everything, and just it's like clockwork. And in the morning, they also know exactly what time my alarm goes off. And so they'll come in about 15 minutes before that and they'll get on the bed and they're, I mean, these are huge dogs. I mean, and the, and the puppy who's about 130 pounds lies right on top of you and, yeah. and, and he, he will wait until the alarm goes off. But, but the clock, the weird thing is that even with daylight savings time, they, they know, they know what time it is and they're still on the same schedule. I don't know how this works. I'm it's completely mysterious. Yeah, that is impressive. I'm impressed that your six, our dog lasted till uh, lived a long life, happy life, I think, and died when he was 17 a few years ago. And, uh, I, I'm impressed, but for the last year or so, I'd say he was not waiting till seven in the morning for his walk. You know, he was out like, you know, Susan, Susan or I had to get up two or three times during the night to walk yeah. him because he was kind of couldn't quite, you know, make it through the night. So, well, that, that's um, one of the I, things you, I'm glad you, that your 16 year old is in such good shape. That's he's, 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 he's doing great. He's going to be around forever, I think. But, but that's, that's one of the reasons why we sleep lightly because, you know, if, if you, if you hear the dogs scrabbling around, yeah. Um, or, you know, about to throw up or any, anything you, you, your, your, your feet hit the gr ground really quickly. Right. I mean, it's just, it is a motivation. So we have a lot of things to talk about uh, today, including uh, amazingly the relationship between, uh, Joe Biden and Vladimir Putin is going to be somewhat different than the relationship between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. And people are having a little bit of trouble with, with all of this. So I, I wanted to bounce this off you first though. Um, very interesting comments by, Former President George Bush, who is uh, at the is, is down in Texas, being interviewed by uh, the Texas Tribune, and is asked about uh, his thoughts about the the insurrection on January six. Actually, we have two cuts, one very very short. This is uh, George Bush uh, talking with I think Evan Smith from uh, Texas Tribune. I was sick to my stomach, Evan, to see our nation's capital being stormed by. Uh, hostile forces. And it really disturbed me to the point where I did put out a statement. And uh, yeah. uh, I'm still disturbed when I think about it. And then he's asked about uh, the election. Was the election stolen or not? No. Okay, that's pretty, pretty, pretty direct. So Bill Crystal, um, apparently Republicans can speak out about the January 6th and describe uh, that they were upset about it. Uh, your thoughts? It's good to hear the president, uh, former President Bush, say that, and I hope it might convince a few people. I got to say, and this will sound ungracious, since I think he said what he said was good, and it was good that he that he stepped up to, to say he didn't have to do that. Uh, but so, if I if I could be permitted to sound a bit ungracious um, and uncharitable, I, I couldn't he be doing a little more to uh, help the forces of reasonableness and decency in the Republican Party, and and therefore the nation? Because again, it it is very much as we've discussed many times on this podcast and written about the bulwark uh, very much in the country's interest to have a the nation's interest to have a sane and healthy republican party not to be dominated by conspiracy mongers and to tolerate the big lie and he lives in texas and various efforts at voter suppression are going on in texas it's a very live issue a live fight and you know that's very much of a part of a consequence of and a cousin sort of of the whole of the big lie, right? I mean, the one the reason for the voter for not trying to uh, say, hey, the reason for not saying 2020 was a good election and we pulled this off under very difficult circumstances. Let's make sure we have the same protocols in place, maybe with some tweaks, of course, so that we could have a big high turnout and fair election in 2022 and 2024. But no, that's not, of course, what state Republican parties are doing. And it'd be good if President Bush weighed in on that, honestly, and uh, and used his clout on that and maybe on a few other issues. He's a big, he was always a big 
uh, uh, fan of, is maybe not quite right, the word, a supporter of, of reasonable immigration policies. The DREAM Act uh, passed the House with, uh, I think, nine Republicans joining all the Democrats. It's it's pending in the Senate. I was just talking about it this morning with someone who's mm-hmm. involved in that. The Republican senators are kind of on the bubble. There are a few who are for it. Maybe some more would come along. I guess I don't know. I know he's supposed to stay out of politics. He's an ex-president, all this kind of stuff. But he could do a lot of good for the country, I think by weighing in a little more aggressively on some of these issues. This is actually an interesting point because, I mean, it goes back to the, you know, the best lacking all conviction, the 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 reluctance of the people who know better to spend political capital on it. Now, you know, on one level, you could say that, well, maybe he's not being more aggressive because he doesn't think he could make a difference. He doesn't think he, he lacks the confidence to think that he would be influential. On the flip side is what has he got to lose at this point? I mean, really, there is literally no political downside for him. Is there? Am I missing something for him to speak out and say, hey, uh, this is this is time for us to, to you know, reaffirm our, our commitment to democracy and to denounce uh, efforts at sedition? Is that really that hard for the guy that stared down Al Qaeda for eight years? And, and, you know, the sort of sophisticated argument is, well, he should, I guess, save his his, his, his chits for what it's really, things are really on the line, perhaps, uh, okay. and or, you know, he will hurt because he's the Republican establishment and it just lets the Trump, the Trumpists say, see, that's the old discredited establishment. Fine, but the Trumpists are going to say that anyway, obviously, mm-hmm. and are saying that. And there are lots of people in, in the real world, in the real world of the Republican Senate and the Republican House and, and in and voters and, and, and Republican voter land who are not you know, hostile to George W. Bush. I haven't seen current polling, but I've got to think in Texas, his numbers are pretty good. And if he weighed in on voting, that would make a difference on Rob Portman work for George W. Bush. If George W. Bush says, we've got to pass the DREAM Act, whatever's happening at the border, let's debate that. Maybe there are good criticisms to be made of President Biden on that. But the DREAM Act is pretty, un- should be pretty uncontroversial. Uh, if you have a couple of tweaks to it, let's hear them. But uh, these people have been here now at this point for 20 years, some of them. Um, and let's regularize their status and so forth. Um, you know, they're the Rob Portmans of the world, the, the, the Pat Toomey's of the world. There'd be a certain number of, of senators who would say, okay, and maybe John Cornyn, right, from Texas, would say, okay, you know what, um, it gives me a little cover to do this. So I, I guess I generally would be in favor of a more aggressive stance by the ex-president. You know, it's again, if it were normal times and we were bickering about a tax bill and what the top marginal rate would be, I'd say former presidents, no need to get involved. But this isn't really normal times for the Republican Party or for the country. He doesn't have to get involved in every issue. But I think the voting issue is is really at a level of, of seriousness for our democracy almost by itself. And then immigration, which is the other one I mentioned, I thought of that just because he was so identified. And I think in an honorable way, with trying to do the right thing on that issue. Yeah, people probably have already almost forgotten the fact that there was a long period of time where leaders of the Republican Party were uh, not immigration restrictionists. In fact, were very, very much open to immigration reform. I mean, John McCain was open to immigration reform. Uh, we, we know what Ronald Reagan had to say about immigration reform. Uh, and then, of course, George Bush, who came very close to being able to get something done. All right. So speaking of the of the insurrection and and, and voting, I want to play for you. It's a, a little bit long, but it's it's so revealing. Kevin McCarthy is, is really a piece of work. I mean, the Republican <laughs> leader in the House of Representatives. And he is uh, he's denouncing there's a little bit of background there. There's one um, congressional seat in Iowa that is uh, is still sort of uh, up in the air. I mean, they've they've the Democrat appears to have won it, but there's a uh, there's a congressional hearing on whether or not there were uh, you know some sort of problems that, uh, that that might result in in overturning that election. This one congressional seat, um, you know, a lot of pressure on the Democrats uh, to. You know, uh, you know, not overturn an election given the the optics of all, but that's all sort of background. So CNN's Manu Raju, they're talking about this, and and uh, and Raju asked this this sort of kind of inevitable question, like you're objecting to possibly overturning this one congressional election in Iowa. Well, uh, how is that consistent with your efforts to overturn the entire 2020 presidential election? And it's interesting the way. McCarthy sort of dodges and pushes back and and uh, chops logic here. So it, it runs about three minutes, but I want to I want to play. And then on on the opposite side, Bill, I want to get your reaction to it. This is uh, Kevin McCarthy talking with CNN's Monday. The Washington. Iowa race, in, in your view, what is different between the efforts there to overturn the elections in the House versus Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the elections in Congress that well. you support? 
I disagree with the premise of your question. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you if you challenged Arizona and Pennsylvania, would that have changed and lowered President Biden's numbers below 270? You supported the Texas no, no, lawsuit. Wait, 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 that would have been validated you, I, millions you of votes. You ask me questions so. every week. I just asked you a question. <laughs> if you removed Arizona, but you weren't removing it, you were just asking the question about it. If Arizona and Pennsylvania were removed in the Electoral College, would President Biden's number lower between lower below, below 270? No, but Donald Trump said okay, that the House could have, no. the Congress wait, 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 could have overturned wait, wait, wait. the election. I'm not Donald that day. Trump. So you're asking me the question. You I'm, a, I'm answering effort, your question. You let me answer your question since you asked me. Let me follow through. So you gave a premise that's not true. Donald Trump tried to overturn the results in Congress, and you support that effort. Well, now you're saying something that's not true. So let me answer your question and show you how your premise is not true. The losing candidate didn't organize a rally and say, stop the steal. We can overturn the, the certification of the Electoral College on January 6th. Hey, you, do, you, do you want to talk to Trump or you want to ask me the question? Because I'm here right now and, I, and I'm showing where your, your question doesn't hold merit. Now, let me show you another answer. But the Texas, you supported the Texas lawsuit, too. Do you regret supporting that lawsuit no, that would have been no, validated? No, no, I don't. You know why? Because well, it's going to the court. In, or did you not support Donald Trump's effort to overturn the election no. in Congress? Didn't we just answer this the first time you asked it? You, I, not you even yes answered no. two. How many, never, how many electoral you, votes does it take to get to 270? You didn't That's certain. You never raised any concerns about Donald Trump's efforts to organize the rally, to say that he could stop Congress. Oh, he does this every time. So it went out and worked there for about five minutes. It was just a bit of a reality check here that Kevin McCarthy voted to overturn the election results in two states, Arizona and Pennsylvania, that happened after the deadly riot that occurred here. There was a re Republican effort of, uh, to overturn the election on six states that day among House Republicans. He never raised any concerns about the effort. That actually did not have a vote because no Senate Republicans joined that effort. Also, he did back that Texas lawsuit that would have invalidated millions of votes in the run-up to the January 6th certification. He clearly is not backing away from that, even though the, he, Texas was saying other states uh, were administering their elections improperly. He didn't back away from that. And, and also, throughout the course of this, Brianna, he never raised concerns about Donald Trump's actions. I had asked him multiple times through the course of December up until January about whether President Biden, President Biden was president-elect at the time. Would he acknowledge that? He would not acknowledge that. He didn't raise any concerns with what Trump was doing and was on uh, television, at least doing one Fox News hit at one point, saying that Donald Trump won the election. So uh, a revised take from the Republican leader here, walking back from his past uh, support of what Donald Trump was doing, either tacit support or overt support. But nevertheless, he is saying here that this is different than what the Democrats are doing in considering whether to overturn that contest at Iowa race. So, B Bill Crystal, um, <laughs> Kevin, Kevin McCarthy, trying to drop the whole, hey, oh, let's overturn the presidential election thing into the memory hole. It didn't happen. I didn't really mean it. We didn't. I mean, you know, throw out Arizona, it wouldn't have made any difference. Wink, wink, wink. And it's like, yeah, the Texas lawsuit would have thrown out the election. So Kevin McCarthy, the, the uh, historical revisionism continues, doesn't it? Yeah, it sure, it sure does. And it reminded me of like, you know, some sort of I don't know, student kind of trying to talk his way out of something with this kind of sophistic arguments. Incidentally, on the congressional lawsuit where they should uphold, I, th I think the House will actually uphold the, the results as certified in Iowa. It's a six vote margin. So it actually, and there's some precedent for the House taking a fresh look at some of these extremely close House elections, but not, um, and I think there's a 22 vote margin in New York that hasn't even been challenged. So it's nothing like what Trump was trying to do or what Kevin McCarthy voted to do on January 6th, uh, January 6th, yeah. in a, after the Electoral College, the electors had certified the election to overturn those two states. And of course, legitimizing the whole notion of overturning everything was why were they so interested in overturning those? I mean, McCarthy's argument to be logical would have to be, we just thought those two states were kind of problematic, but we had no interest in actually changing the election outcome. Is that the rhetoric surrounding the efforts around of January 6th? Yeah. I don't think so. So yeah, no, he's there. But I've already struck how much everyone wants to just memory hole January 6th for about 48 hours after January 6th. It was an amazing event. It was a defining moment. I mean, for the party, for, for Trump, uh, Kevin McCarthy himself, uh, January 13th, voting, of course, against impeachment, said it was, I can't remember what word to use, indefensible or whatever. The president was responsible for this. 
Two weeks later, he's at Mar-a-Lago, and now everyone's on board and wants Trump's endorsement, and there's no problem. I mean, it's really the degree to which this is the big, the big development from November 3rd on, I would say, has been the repeated moments where one thought, okay, enough already. They can get off the Trump train, get off the anti, get, get off the overturning the election train, get off the big lie train, uh, get off the voter suppression train. And at no point has a majority of, of the Republican Party really in its elected officials or unfortunately in its voters uh, chosen to get off that train. You know, I mean, a couple of things to keep in mind. Amanda Carpenter has a piece in the bulwark about this today where she's talking about uh, Kevin McCarthy's press conference. And she, she says, look, uh, just to remind you folks, uh, two days after the election, Kevin McCarthy went on Fox News and declared President Trump won this election. So everyone who's listening, do not be quiet. We cannot allow this to happen before our very eyes. OK, <laughs> even after the Electoral College met to ratify Biden's election in December, McCarthy refused to call Biden president elect. McCarthy was one of the 126 House Republicans who supported that completely bogus lawsuit from the Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, which would cancel the votes in the swing states Biden won. And as you pointed out, on January 6th, even after the attack on the Capitol, he voted to um, you know, support the objections to the, the, the wins in Iowa. I'm sorry, in Arizona and in Pennsylvania. And as Amanda writes, McCarthy would like everybody to forget all that. He's put it all out of his mind. So I actually heard uh, that that uh, uh, my name was dragged last night during our uh, Bulwark live stream because I had been somewhat optimistic that it, that January 6th would be a turning point. I think Tim Miller um, was mocking me. Um, some of the other, you know, the anti-dog people were. Um, right. It was a game proxy game. for the dog. Yeah, it was, it was, yeah it's, it's really you have to understand it's really about dog people and cat people. So the. The the anti dog cabal was going well. Charlie Sykes actually thought that Republicans might be, you know, you know, might be horrified by all of this, and there might be a change. And the answer is, yeah, I actually did because I mean, I, in retrospect, it was naive, but it was so horrific that you did think that that people would would you know reel back from this and you know recognize how close to the brink they had they had they had gotten, but it hasn't. You're and you're right. The uh, you know, the the memory holding of the last uh, two months has been truly, truly extraordinary. Well, so, just just two more little points yeah. about it. I mean, Arizona, just to not to worth dwelling on, they shouldn't challenge any of them. But Arizona was, a, let's just not forget, a Republican yeah. governor, a Republican secretary of state and a Republican state legislature. So what is the even plausible possible justification for that? I mean, that really is that that shows the degree of craziness in the effort that culminated on January 6th which I believe correlates, unfortunately, with the degree of craziness we now see in Republican circles in some of these Senate candidates in Ohio, Josh Mandel and uh, uh, J.D. Vance, who Mona Sharon wrote a piece about. Uh, it, it correlates with McCarthy's cravenness and refusing to, I mean, now he's sort of explaining away the the effort to overturn the election, but he's not repudiating it. He's not repudiating, certainly not repudiating Donald Trump, God forbid, and what Trump and or the big lie. And for me, that's the fundamental thing. A party that won't repudiate that big lie and its consequences, how can you, A, and that's bad enough, that's very bad. B, it's using the big lie to justify voter suppression in a ton of states and to make a broader argument about how we have to cut back on the uh, the 2020 uh, wasn't a success. It was somehow a, a terrible election. Terrible. And that's a very bad thing. Going forward, that has real implications, obviously, as we see in all these states where this is being fought. The interesting thing, there was a poll in Texas yesterday that showed that the, actually the Texas voters, who obviously voted for majority for Trump, and are, uh, including Texas Republicans, Thought 2020 was a well-run election. They were they, they think it was fair. They were happy with the way they were able to vote. I wonder on the voting issue, I haven't really seen much detail polling on this, whether Trump world is all in on it. And Trump world is, I don't know, two-thirds of the Republican Party. But I wonder on that one, more than on others, that the other Republican, the rest of the Republican Party, including just a lot of people who voted by mail, a lot of people who took advantage of early voting, a lot of people who looked around and thought, you know what, my neighbors, my friends, uh, my colleagues, we all kind of voted and it seemed like it was well, went well and the count was fair. Yeah. I wonder how much they are at risk of, of letting Biden assemble a pretty big coalition in favor of of uh, of uh, supporting, you know, uh, uh, fair voting and and against suppressing 
the vote. I wonder if that's an issue where the Trump Trump world's a little out of touch with some chunk of the Republican electorate. It doesn't seem that being the party of anti-voting is is a really <laughs> smart political move. I it just I, I I've wondered about this as a strategy, but this is one of those cases where they really have started to talk to one another. It's sort of like the you know Fox News you know entertainment universe where they have these certain you know memes and narratives. Uh, Nicholas Grossman had a great piece about this. Uh, in the bulwark yesterday, right. how they, they, they talk to each other, you know, basically sharing um, all of these obsessions with one another, but the people on the outside going, okay, so you want to make it so that I can't vote absentee next time by mail, because that actually worked pretty well last time. Hey, by the way, speaking of the big lie, I don't want to pass this by because, you know, it, 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 the, the old adage about how, how hard it is for the truth to catch up with a lie. You saw that the U.S. Postal Service investigators came up with a report uh, this week finding no evidence to support that uh, claim by a Pennsylvania postal worker that his supervisors had tampered with mail-in ballots. This is the Inspector General's report. Um, that story originally um, had become really central in Trump world to the big lie. And Lindsey Graham wrote a letter uh, to the Department of Justice, you know, asking for an investigation about all of this. This guy was named Richard Hopkins, a mail carrier. And he basically made up the story in November that he overheard local postmaster talking about plans to backdate the ballots received after Election Day and pass them off as legitimate. And he worked with, you know, the grifters from Project Veritas. Well, it turns out that now he admits that he made up the whole story, that he had no evidence whatsoever. So I, I don't know. But but again, it was out there long enough to do the damage. And that's the problem. It was pretty evident at the time that it was fraud, so. fake. And again, I'm waiting for Lindsey Graham to just as a matter of like public decency and setting the record straight, uh, saying, you know what? I was wrong about that. I was taken in and I regret writing that letter and I regret feeding into a narrative. Uh, because that was not a trivial part of the whole the Fox Trump narrative. But of course, Lindsey Graham isn't going to do that. And I, I don't know what he would say to Manu Raju today on the Hill if, 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 if he got cornered in a press conference and or on TV and went on something other than Fox and, and we actually got asked what he now thinks about it. I guess he'd say, well, at the time, I thought it was just worth, just worth looking into, just asking questions. Just asking that's questions. Their, that's their current uh, the ridiculous way of avoiding actual responsibility as elected officials. Okay, so let's talk about the uh, the, uh, the 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 dust up with Vladimir Putin. Looking at the headline in the New York Times, Russia erupts in fury after Biden's call uh, calls uh, Putin a killer. Kremlin describes the U.S. president's response to an interview question as very bad. They recall their ambassador to the United uh, States. Uh, Putin, being very very snarky, wishes the president good health on Thursday. Um, and on Thursday, seated in a gilded chair on the seventh anniversary of Russia's annexation of Crimea, Putin all but called Mr. Biden a killer himself. Interestingly enough, there's some there's some really you know hand wringing going on from Trump world about how mean Joe Biden is to Vladimir Putin. Isn't that kind of interesting? Because I thought that the MAGAverse liked tough talk. I like I, I thought the MAGAverse liked it when presidents insulted bad guys, but apparently not always. Yeah, not not the bad guys who are helping you in the in the 2016 or 2020 election, as the intelligence community concluded, but on China as well, where they allegedly really do want well, they certainly do want to demonize China in some ways, though not it's not clear what real policies they're they're in favor of, um, but they're willing to sort of play quasi racist cards and so forth with some to some real obviously uh, terrible effects. I would say here at home. Um, there, we had a meeting yesterday of Trump, of, uh, of uh, President Biden, Secretary of State, and National Security Advisor with the Chinese, much tougher than all, all the big talk of Trump and Mike Pompeo and stuff. But as John Bolton said, in practice, Trump was, was pathetic with Xi. And here they are actually seem to be standing up to China and thinking through a poly combination of policies. It's not an easy thing to deal with. And obviously no one wants to be irresponsibly hawkish in the sense of, you know, when we're stumbling into some confrontation, we can't manage either. And we have trading relationships, some of which are okay and so forth. But um, I do think in general, I was talking with a foreign policy type about this last night, you know, it, it, on the spectrum of will Biden be Obama too, or, or even more left wing than Obama on foreign policy to will Biden be kind of, almost like a McCain uh, Republican. He's obviously not a McCain Republican, but he's closer to that, I would say, than uh, than to 
the left wing caricature of, of what he would be like. Or, or another way of saying it is that I think compared to the Obama administration, I do think the, many of them the same people, of course, beginning with Biden, they sort of were mugged by reality. They were, they were out of office. They watched uh, both the effects of what Obama had done and, and the effects of Trump's foreign policy. And they do seem to be um, somewhat encouraged on the foreign policy front in general. There are a million tough challenges and a million things to navigate. And on Iran, but even on Iran, they haven't gone. If you think of the kind of the, the, the intelligent, I'd say, conservative talking points of skepticism about Biden when, I, when you and I supported him and people would say, oh, you know what, he's going to go right back into the JCPOA with Iran, give up on the pressure on China. And the Putin stuff was just anti-Trump talk, and they're going to go right back to a reset with Putin. And those were not crazy things to say, given the Obama administration's performance. But none of them has, is true, as at least as of yet. Yeah, and no, they're 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 not. But they but they stick with the they stick with the narratives. You know, for, you know, for example, you know that the Joe Biden is completely senile, and he comes out and once again shows that he's not. I mean, maybe he may stumble now and then, but he, but he's not. It doesn't make any uh, any difference. So let's talk about the filibuster again. I know this, this we've gone over this before, but but I see that uh, it, it it has inspired you to actually start quoting um, quoting Thucydides um, about the. Oh, right. um, I didn't. See, I, I didn't. I did notice that. Yeah, way. that's good. No, I, I I didn't even mention the cities. You're such a well-educated person. You know, that's what Twitter's for, to, to, to drop allusions that aren't explained and then have the the really uh, the clever readers on Twitter. <laughs> yes, we're, I just we're, we're, about allusions. The quote you had in the newsletter this morning uh, from Swift, which is about the truth, you know, uh, a lie once told, you know, the truth never catches mm-hmm. up, is really a fantastic, I hadn't, I don't think I'd seen the full quotation, at least not in ages. And it's well, really terrific, isn't it? I mean, it's better than the kind of one sentence version that people just use as a shorthand. Yeah, uh, yeah no, the, actually, the, and that's how I found it. Um, I actually was was looking up the the quote about how you know the a lie goes around the world before the truth can put on its shoes, and that's kind yeah. of a Mark Twain quote. But um, I always go on quote investigator because about sixty uh, percent of the time, the quotes that you think are attributed to somebody are completely bogus or apocryphal. So um, I did go on and found that the original quote is from Jonathan Swift, and I'll, I'll read it. It says, "As the vilest writer has his readers, so the greatest liar has his believers." And it often happens that if a lie be believed only for an hour, it has done its work, and there was no farther occasion for it. Falsehood flies, and the truth comes limping after it, so that when men come to be undeceived, it is too late. The jest is over, and the tale has had its effect. And that is a fantastic quote. I hadn't thought about Twain, but you're right. The the normal ascription, and I take it it's a true ascription, is to Twain, who must have used it. In his own way, but Twain, of course, would have read Swift. I think they, they were very similar. Yeah. <laughs> they had a lot of, you know, Twain. I bet was influenced a lot by Swift and that kind of dark, uh, you know, uh, misanthropic, uh, satirical sensibility. So um, that's interesting. Yeah, but isn't the Swift quote? Swift quotation is fantastic. Yeah. So um, for back back to Thucydides, because you you can you can dazzle your friends by recognizing this. You put out this tweet uh, talking about the you know the the threat of a scorched earth Senate from. McConnell, that if you abolish the the, uh, the the filibuster, you know we will shut everything down. And you you tweeted out, uh, McConnell, we denied uh, we did we denied Merrick Garland a hearing. We enabled Trump's assault on the rule of law, but we'll be mad if you alter the filibuster, even in response to a national assault on voting rights. We Republicans do what we want. You Democrats suffer what you must. And that's the that's the th- th- Thucydides yeah. things that that you have to you suffer what we we must. I'm trying to think these were the Athenian prisoners who were captured right. and sent to right. some island and very. So you, you want to talk about minimalist approach, you know, and then they had to suffer what men must, which is oh, oh, um, could have been much more grisly. But it is interesting when you think about, uh, you know, how what what McConnell was able to pull off. So, for example, uh, and I mentioned this on the podcast the other day. Uh, Amy Coney Barrett was confirmed with 52 votes. Now, by the way, I, I think that she's you know going to be a solid Supreme Court justice, which may antagonize some of the listeners. But uh, 52 votes. They changed the rules. They they invoked the nuclear option for a Supreme Court nominee, and they rushed that through in about 30 days. And he's looking around, going, "Well, but you can't challenge the institutional norms of the United States Senate." <laughs> McConnell has done it over and over and over again. They thought the Supreme Court was important enough to do that, and yet suddenly now they are incredibly indignant that some Democrats might think that restoring voting rights uh, 
um, might also be important enough to carve out an exception to the filibuster. Yeah, and no, I was struck by his rhetoric, uh, as I think you were too, that, um, you know, that usually with McConnell, I'd say you get, you know, kind of a high-toned argument about for the filibuster, I don't agree with it, but it's not great, ridiculous, you know, that it forces compromise and it's the Senate, it's not the House, and 60 votes can produce better legislation. It hasn't, they have not much evidence of that, I would say, in the last 10, 20 years. But nonetheless, um, it's, 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 in theory, that's the argument for the filibuster. And usually then the kind of the threat is said quietly and privately, you know, uh, in, to, to the Democratic senators. It's interesting that he went so public with the really crude threat. I, you know, if you do this, this being slightly unspecified, whether it's to bust the filibuster for everything or just once for voting rights and so forth, or bust it by repealing it or just modifying it to being a, a talking filibuster, et cetera. That if you do that, we're going scorched earth, you know, we'll totally tie up the Senate, it'll be an unbelievable mess, uh, we'll consist on, you know, uh, you know, quorum calls and uh, roll call votes for everything and, and so forth. And I, I sort of, I do wonder, like, why, why put that out there now, right over, I mean, that can be conveyed privately to Chuck Schumer and to every Democratic mm-hmm. senator. Why make that the public sort of argument? I think there's a little desperation there, a little sense that the Democrats are beginning to get to sort of line things up to at least modify the filibuster, a little sense that Manchin and Cinema might go along once there's been a good faith effort to get the things through with a 60 vote rule. They have to obviously try that first and give Republicans a chance to sort of be reasonable or, 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 or show that the legislative process is working as opposed to just voting against everything. Um, and then, uh, and then maybe that the, I, I just, I'm a little, but it struck me as a little hmm. bit of a bluff, maybe too. That I mean, it, it gives a talking point, I guess. To the, and I saw the Wall Street Journal published actually an excerpt version of McConnell's remarks. They were so entranced by it, I suppose. But is that really a good argument to make in politics? That if you do this, we're going to be do even worse. It's something you do with the Soviet Union in 1963. You know, mutual assured destruction and stuff. It's an appropriate way to speak to. Uh, uh, an adversary of the country. It's not usually the way you, you you make an argument in politics. And I was struck. It just struck me about McConnell doing that. And maybe there's a little bit of desperation. Maybe he thinks, but maybe he also understands the current state of American politics, which is this: you rally your your side, you rally your team, not by making a sort of public spirited argument or why this is for the common good. You rally your team by saying, if you do this, we'll do even worse. Really well, you know, now, now that you mentioned, yeah, now that you mentioned, it doesn't really seem like a plausible um, threat because Mitch McConnell is nothing if not transactional, and there are things that he wants to do. There are favors he wants to give. He still yeah. is in a position to get things done on at least on the margins, and to say that well, it's going to be scorched earth basically means to you know all of his donors, all of his constituents. Yeah, um, we're going to be shutting down. We're not going to be doing anything for you at all. Nothing. Plus, he doesn't run the, the Republican conference as a dictator. And mm. does Lisa Murkowski kind of agree with that? She may vote against modifying the filibuster, but doesn't she also, as you say, want to get amendments to bills? And is she really going to go along vote after vote after vote as McConnell behaves like Marjorie Taylor Greene is trying to behave in the House and, and just tie it up? She, other Republicans are not supporting Greene on that. And so, I, again, I wonder, Romney and not just even you know, Burr, Toomey, a lot of Republicans in the Senate, or at least some number, are going to say, wait a second, we don't hey. agree with what they did. Just as, but look, the Democrats didn't agree with shutting down the filibuster on the Supreme Court justices. The Republicans didn't agree with shutting down the filibuster on the executive branch appointees and lower court judges. And no one, I mean, there's a little bit of obstructionism and delay after both of those things, but no, no, nothing like this. So, and again, and finally, just on the uh, Justice Barrett point, I mean, it is kind of rich to, you know, you, you jam through three justices uh, uh, after blocking Garland, who will be on the court for a lifetime. And as McConnell himself stresses over and over again, this is the most important thing we've done. These justices are there yeah. forever. The courts resolve so many important issues. We did this with 52 votes, as you said, with, with Amy Cody Barrett. But how dare you think of doing anything with 51 or 52 votes? Well, e- exactly. By the way, um, that was pretty good. Uh, Mitch McConnell going full Marjorie Taylor Greene. For people who don't get that whole reference, Marjorie Taylor Greene has been just annoying everybody, including some of her fellow Republicans, by standing up and just trying to shut down the House of Representatives by moving to adjourn. And more and more Republicans have been voting against the, her motions. I think it was 40 last time. 
And the only point, of course, is just to slow things down. It's completely nihilistic and everything. And so Mitch McConnell is saying, yeah, you, you see what those guys are doing over in the House? That's what I'm going to do over here on the Senate. It's not a good look. And um, I'm, I'm guessing that uh, you're not going to get everybody to go along with it. OK, so you want to talk about cancel culture just a little bit, just a little sure. bit this morning? OK, Ed, because I saw that you, you had tweeted out about it. This is the story. And but a, before we get into it, anytime we say this might be a turning point, we're, we're going to be wrong. So just, right. Even though I suggest that maybe this is a turning point. It's the story of this young, uh, promising young uh, African-American journalist named Alexi McCammon, who's out of a job as the editor in chief of Teen Vogue, which is not a great publication. I want to raise my hand on all of this, but she'd been named editor in chief. And um, there were people who, you know, decided they were going to be indignant about some tweets that she had written 10 years ago when she was 17. And as of yesterday, she is out of this job because of these teenage tweets. And it is the backlash. And she had apologized for these tweets over and over again. She didn't wait till she had the job or was exposed. She apologized back in 2019. Uh, the timing for her was bad because uh, some of the tweets mocked Asian Americans. There were some slurs. Um, which she regretted, she said, but this comes at a time when there's violence against Asian Americans. And, you know, what's interesting is that that nothing in her subsequent career, the last decade of her life, all of her accomplishments or her apologies, which were quite abject, made any difference whatsoever. And he writes, McCammond apologized. She apologized profusely profusely. She apologized repeatedly. And she did not just apologize this week when her job was in jeopardy. She apologized back in 2019. But it wasn't enough. It never will be. This is what uh, Rabbi Zitzoav uh, writes. The new enforcers of morality, the pitchfork wielding employees of progressive media companies and their swarms of social media allies have decided that no one may dwell in their midst unless they are born without sin. This poisonous approach will, if anything, make people more reticent to apologize or acknowledge wrongdoing. Instead, they'll shrug and say, what's the point? Now, when, when I say this might be a, a turning point, which it won't be, of course, it was interesting how much blowback there was from progressives in the media, you know, Mehdi Hassan from MSNBC, Chris Hayes from MSNBC, um, other writers who were saying, look, this is absolutely ridiculous. This is a wonderful young woman. She had done nothing wrong uh, to take away her job, to take away the job based on some dumb things she wrote when she was 17. This is crazy. How does this advance the cause of anti-racism? How does this make us a kinder and gentler and more inclusive society to take someone who is clearly not a racist now and say, uh, we're, we're going to cast you into outer darkness because 10 years ago, uh, as a teenager, you put some things on Twitter that are problematic. Yeah, no, I, I, I didn't follow it very closely. So I, uh, I will admit, but I, I read your newsletter this morning. Actually, it was a nice, very good comprehensive summary of it, including the quotes from Chris Hayes and mm -hmm. others. And it is, I, I don't understand actually why she, did she really just quit or, I mean, what is going on at these organizations? Uh, it's, it's not like the leadership, I think, wanted her to quit. It's not like her peers were saying it's unacceptable, right? So it's like, a, I guess, the staff, is the staff a Teen Vogue? Are we pretending that Teen Vogue is like, I mean, uh, such a highly serious political organization, you know, uh, intellectual place that they can't tolerate someone who said something yeah. 10 years ago? It's, it's I don't know. So I, I find it actually, I really don't honestly understand whether she could have gutted it out, whether her bosses didn't want to they didn't like the publicity maybe people were people threatening to resign en masse or was it just yes it's extremely yeah. unpleasant if you're working so trying to run an organization where people are rebelling against you i guess but was it I, that's why i almost i do wonder if this is a little bit so crazy that um maybe it will cause people to say wait a second i mean something tweeted 10 years ago when you're 17 is very different from presiding over a toxic workplace environment. You know what? That is a problem. And I have no, yeah. and I have no problem with people being called to account for that, but we're, we've totally lost any ability to distinguish, uh, apparently, uh, uh, anything. Well, also, I mean, if, if you want to make society better, then you have to be open to the possibility of right. society evolving and growing and changing. And, and yet w when you cancel somebody like Alexi McCammon, you're basically saying, no, you can never change. There's, 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 no, there's no redemption whatsoever. There's no way back from something you did when you were a kid. And I, there, there is the, these, these, 
these these woke mobs in some of these media companies that are demanding this, uh, you know, homogenous ideological environment. And unfortunately, you see the places like the New York Times, where you have reporters who are driven out based on things, you know, relatively minor incidents that occurred years and years ago, and they put tremendous pressure on management and uh, management resists for a while. And then at some point goes, we can't take it, we can't do it. And and they and they buckle. It, it really seems to be more about a power play, a demand for conformity than it does about uh, advancing the cause of social justice or yeah, understanding. So. I think it's, it's, it's part of an expressive culture of these, I guess, uh, uh, employees who want to express themselves and feel that they'll be cleansed if they purge this person from their midst. It's performative. No actual argument. I haven't seen one, at least, that this will actually be good for minorities or good for the future or treatment of them or make people more sensitive to them. Um, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's in that respect, it's, it's bad. And, and it is illiberal, of course. And I don't, I, I, you mentioned, you know, sort of the pressure from these, I mean, how much pressure can they, that's why I guess I'm a little mystified by the weakness of management too. I think they, I guess they just don't want to be yelled at much, but the truth is, does anyone seriously think if team, if the met, whoever I knew, was it Conde Matt and asked, I guess, yeah, if they I, said, forget it. This is an impressive young woman. She, she has apologized. We stand behind her. Nothing is changing. How many of those people would have quit from Teen Vogue? How many people would refuse to work? How bad would, with two months from now, would people be really having issues about it? I don't believe that for a minute, you know? I think this would be more like Governor Northam here in Virginia, where I live, who, it's a little hard to know what he did or didn't do 30 years ago with the, you know, the photo in the yearbook. But anyway, he's, he's I mean, I sort of agree, admire him for this. Almost. He just said, look, this is not relevant. I haven't done a, th I've been a physician and then a politician for 30 years. No one's accused me of anything. Uh, this was foolish, or he's, I guess it's unclear whether he did or didn't put on the blackface. But in any case, I'm not resigning because of this. And you know what? He's being governor of Virginia. This is a bit of a Black People are fine. Yeah. Use that term on his on his resume. If he wanted to run for higher office, he probably would, might be a disqualifier. But it's not. It's not. You know, he didn't quit, and people are working with him, African Americans and everyone else equally. And he's actually been a pretty decent governor. So I, I mean, I think having a little toughness. But he's a governor, and he just chose not to quit. What's amazing is the management of these companies capitulating to the employees who well, are not right. responsible or serious. They're not thinking about the well-being of the company as a whole, the well-being of media organizations as a whole, let alone the well-being of society as a whole. Well, and, and this one was was defensible. I mean, they could have pushed back and said, okay, your concerns are legitimate about these tweets. These tweets are bad, but but they were 10 years ago. She was 17 years old. She's apologized repeatedly. Um, we are not going to... Uh, we're not going to, uh, you know, hold this against someone, destroy someone's career based on all of that. That is unreasonable. We're going to look forward. Uh, we're going, you know, et, et cetera. I think that would have been defensible. So, again, when, when the reaction to this, I think, was very interesting. So Mehdi Hassan, who uh, has a show on Peacock and MSNBC, one of the, by the way, the brightest guys on the media. Have you ever been on his show? Just be yeah, then I'm with him. Yeah. No. Okay. This guy is this guy is crazy smart, and he is always prepared. He's sort of like a BBC presenter, and he is really, really, really good. But he's very progressive, and he tweeted out, "This made me sad and frustrated. Surely we can see the difference between active, current racists and bigots and people who said things long ago that they have already sincerely apologized for. Have we lost all sense of proportion? And which of us has not said or done things we regret?" Chris Hayes, very progressive host on MSNBC. I'm really fine if we all just agree to make tweets from minors, no matter how bad, uh, don't count in adult life rule and apply that across the board. Anyway, so um, this is a, it, it's a silly case. And, it, you know, so Alexi McCann is out of a job, but Andrew Cuomo is still governor of New York. Do you think he's going to survive this? Because I'm getting the sense that he's going to gut this out. I mean, it looks that way. We discussed that on the live stream last night. Some and some of the other people, I think, some of our colleagues have been following it more closely than I. I mean, he can be impeached. I mean, I don't know if the New York State Assembly is moving seriously to do that. Obviously, they have Democratic majorities. So let's see if they if they uh, follow through on sort of the, the vague statements people have made about how unacceptable it is. But that is actual conduct of his as a governor, both in terms of lying about the nursing home fatalities uh, and in terms of the apparent sexual harassment of some kinds or other. 
And, uh, you know, that's not 20 years ago. That's not, I mean, he's had a checkered career, but no one's even raising that. This is very much current activity of the governor in the governor's mansion, uh, using state employees to falsify, apparently, uh, records and death tolls and then harassing other state employees. So, you know, this is at least legitimate question of whether he should therefore be removed as governor. And uh, I, but it looks like he's going to, he's trying to take the Northam, he's trying to co- implicitly, as people are saying, well, it's like Governor Northam, we just have to tough it out. It's not fair to Governor Northam, who did nothing as governor that anyone's been, been very upset about. Um, and, uh, and that was 30 years ago. But um, I don't know. Maybe Cuomo will, 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 will tough it. I guess he can't. I don't think he can really run again now, though. So I suppose in that yeah, respect, you know. he'll pay. Well, you know, who, who, who knows? I mean, the arrogance of this guy. And, yeah. um, with, you know, all the stories coming out, people going, yeah, he's always been like this. It's been, you know, he's been terrible. He's been, you know, he's been a bully and, uh, he's, uh, you know, pu- pushed the, the envelope on, on the conduct, you know, over, you know, for years and years and years. It is interesting though, how all of these people are coming out now, how completely disliked he is. And I don't know whether New York politics appears to be a world in and of itself where you have these incredibly arrogant jerks who rise in politics and don't really apparently care whether or not you know, people like them and people go along with it uh, up until the point when they don't think they have to anymore. And then these guys find that there's no one behind them. You know, Elliot yeah. Spitzer's looking around and going, I have no friends. Right. Nobody likes me. I'm gone. And Andrew Cuomo is perhaps finding out that the fact that he has no actual friends is probably a disadvantage. But I, I do think there's this new there's this new standard in politics. It's sort of the Bill Clinton, Ralph Northam, as you said, a little bit unfairly, but Northam, Andrew Cuomo standard, which is whatever you do, don't resign because you, you, you know, people have a limited attention spans. There's always a way to come back. You change the subject and people forget, just don't resign. Um, you know, hang in there as long as you possibly can. And who knows? So that's why what I is think Al Franken point. thinking now. I mean, well, exactly. Well, and, and, and that's saying? the counter argument, yeah, I mean, right? Really? It was so, I don't want to be minimize it. It was a little t- t- tasteless, but it was not. I mean, he was never charged with anything. Literally, no one made a complaint, as to my knowledge, uh, about his behavior, and certainly not. As, and, and and obviously, subsequently, there's been no criminal or civil action or anything. So, what what exa- You know, what, what what was he? And he and they they forced forced him out because I guess they wanted to to be a good on the good side of the Me Too movement at the time. And, and, and Jill Brand was running for president and she was at the, spe- yeah. at the tip of the spear and no one wanted to take on uh, the feminists as they saw it in the Republican yep. and the Democratic Party. But again, these things do, that has a, that kind of mob mentality. That is the worst thing about cancel culture. It's, right. it's, it's, the, it's the mob side of it, in my opinion. It's less criticizing people or, or even, you know, some of these complicated legal issues of who should be accountable for what and so forth, or free speech issues on campus and so forth. It's, it's the ginning up of the mob and forcing it to, uh, to, uh, you know, to, 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 to get rid of someone. And then of course, let's Cuomo say, well, I'm not going to bow to the mob. And suddenly he gets a little bit of, I don't know if he gets real support, but maybe a little sympathy from voters who are looking around thinking, I don't know, these mobs seem out of control. So, well, let Cuomo, let, let Cuomo well, exactly. It, let's term, you know, now you can imagine somebody sitting in uh, Cuomo's office saying, so who do you want to be? Do you want to be Ralph Northam? You know, who's still governor of Virginia or do you want to be, um, you know, do you want to be Al Franken? Who's probably regretting resigning over and over again, by the way, the Franken thing, that that moment where uh, I think Democrats thought, you know what, if we hold Frank into this high standard, we will shame Republicans yeah. to holding their own people to a standard. And then, of course, only to find out that once they'd thrown Franken under the bus, that there was no way to shame Republicans, that the superpower of Republicans was complete and utter shamelessness. So it is amazing. It didn't work. I don't even <laughs> read too much, but these, pri- these stories that come out about various members of Congress, Republican mostly members of Congress and their personal lives, and again, not 20 years ago when they were 20 years old, but, you know, very recently um, and currently in some cases, it seems to have no effect at all, including on their no. voters and supporters who are supposed to be these kind of moralistic types who are, you know, very offended by uh, uh, immorality and stuff. It's pretty, uh, the, the disconnect there and the willingness to just forget about all this talk about this character and standards is, is pretty is pretty striking. So uh, it's the weekend podcast. Have you and Susan set aside time to watch the Snyder Cut this weekend? Yeah, no, that's right. I'm leaving that to you and Sunny uh, and Sunny Bunch. I don't even know what I don't know. I don't know who Snyder is. I don't know what he's cut or hasn't cut, and which of the. I guess he does these these you know superhero movies, but uh, what what to think of them? So I'm I'm a little bit out of it in terms. You know, luckily oh, this you is know. Maybe a, 
the the younger people at the at the bulwark, uh, JBL and Tim Miller and Sarah Longwell, they're there to to keep us in touch with popular culture and to uh, uh, criticize, make make them make themselves look ridiculous by being anti dog. And you yeah, and that's, Mona that's and true. I are here to be the voices of you know reason, civility, and uh, and judiciousness, and also to defend the noble our noble friends, the dogs. And, and 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 it's quite a clear division. Um, so just for people to know, I I don't think I knew what the Snyder Cut was until like four days ago. And it's this is put this way: it's 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 out there. It's a four hour movie, four hour super <laughs> movie, and it's it's a remake of a movie that was generally panned. And Zack Snyder um, apparently this has been a you know this popular culture thing that hey you know let let him finish his own movie and and do it, but but four hours. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't I want to cancel him. Let me make clear: it's a free country. If people want to watch that four-hour movie, well, people like you and me watch. Uh, I don't know, uh, Broadchurch, or uh, you and I were discussing before we got on the air mm-hmm. this uh, French uh, crime drama that I've discovered. Which again, the whole again half the world knew about, but I'm so out of it. Uh, I don't. It called uh, um, Spiral, uh, which is really quite good. The gritty underside of Paris. I think it's really. Be- I have not heard of this. Um, yeah. So yeah it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a French crime series. Spiral. Yes, and it's sort of two. It's the police detectives. Kind of, I'd say think it like Law and Order in Paris. Probably is maybe the best way huh. to think of it. A little bit more, a little bit maybe more sophisticated in terms of the characters. They kind of cut corners to, to because they're understaffed and they've got these powerful bad guys they've got to deal with. But it is, you know, if a if you think that you know a little French and I know a little, um, I think you do too. It it gives you the conceit, the, the satisfaction. You watch it. Of course, you have the subtitles on, so you can really understand it. But you think to yourself, hey, I kind of understand. It's great. My French is pretty good. I can understand this. Of course, the moment you test it by turning off the subtitles, you're lost in about 20 seconds. But yeah, I'm, 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 much, be- I'm much better with the subtitles. I would have to watch. hearing people speak French well. And I'd say it is true if you've been to Paris a few times, uh, and I've been a few times, and you know, you see it all, of course, all the tourist things and all the great uh, architecture and the uh, art galleries and you know the cafes on the west yeah. bank and the left bank, west bank, the left bank, and then this Italy is the kind of gritty underside of Paris. Immigrants, you know, who aren't living very well and working class toughs and so forth. It is sort of interesting to see that. And this is a genuinely this is it was a pretty big hit in France. So this is kind of their own view of you might say of of that side of their of their country uh and of how law enforcement works pretty rough you know so it's 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 kind of a it, it isn't the charming you know uh elegant uh, upper class uh parisian parisians or french it's the, this is not the elitist the view side. of france yeah. so sarah, sarah longwell um when when she's not dragging dog people it's actually now a new podcast based on the french village yeah i have not seen that did so you guys, watch that so are you going to have a is, it, is, is there going to be a bill crystal podcast about spiral no, I just feel like she's watching The French Village, which is, you know, 862 episodes or something of deep yeah, I know. anguish and choices in Vichy, France and so and stuff. And I'm watching a kind of cop thriller that's the French version of Law and Order. So some of us, you know, are more comfortable with just being ourselves. And some of us want to, you know, get into the deep conversations and have podcasts with Ben Wittes about what the real moral dilemmas are and stuff. And that's it's good. We have room for different types here at the Bulwark. I just think we have enough moral dilemmas in real life, in, <laughs> in, 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 in real time. I don't need to watch totally. a show about Vichy France. I feel like we're living in Vichy anyway. Totally. So, That's exactly. Okay. I want to watch escapist, you know, police police dramas, right? Well, I, just, just for the record, I may actually watch the Snyder Cut this week. I, I, I may do it just, just, just so that I can talk with the, with the kids, the youngs, the youngs That's about good. this. I'm, I'm, de- I'm letting you do that. Bill Crystal, thanks so much for joining me. Have a great weekend. You too, Charlie. And thank you for listening to the Bulwark Podcast today. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back on Monday, and we'll do this all over again.